I'm always interested in titles, books. You know, they give so much away. And before you leave, full of ambiguity, and you're leaving home, or maybe you're leaving the, the nest and care of your family. And maybe you're even leaving university and training and heading off into the world. And you know, then the ultimate question is, where are you going to go when you die? Uh, we lost our oldest son. And out of that, I took a year to think it over very carefully. And one of the takeaways from all of that is that it is so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to be sort of taken on into various rabbit holes where you're fixing this or that problem in the world or you're, or you're just trying to survive. But sooner or later, if you don't face the ultimate questions uh, of death and what it is to meet God, then I think there's something lacking. You've got a, a massive hole in your thinking about existence and life as a whole, and, and death brings us up short. One of the things actually that has always captured me in my own journey is A, not just the reality of evil. Uh, many people, evil drove them away from God. In my case, it was quite the opposite. But one of the things that I found intoxicating about the Christian faith is that at the heart of it is in fact the death of someone who's loved us more than we ever love ourselves. And we can then deal with the challenge of death and life beyond the grave because we can do it in the presence of a risen Lord who's been through all that. And one of the things that I love about this book is that Todd has found a way to introduce that that's uh, clear and crisp and that's honest and authentic. And that, that's not easy. Oh God, we pray that you will take our minds and think through them, that you will take my lips and speak through them, and above all, that you will take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you and for our neighbor. Now then the question arises, well, why drag anti-Semitism into this, all of this? Why drag the Jews into it? I mean, after all, there are all sorts of other religious groups in the United States. We even have Methodists, for heaven's sake. By the way, it was the Irish that brought Methodism to America. And the English came over later and wrecked it. That's neither here nor there. Now, this is where it gets difficult. If you agree in broad terms with the analysis that I've just articulated, then I ask you to consider its obvious application to a long-standing problem in doctrines of the Christian life. And I have in mind the tension between grace and freedom. The issue is a simple one. If salvation is of grace, then it's brought about by God. Thus we can take no credit or make any claim to merit on our part. Yet there's no salvation without, at the very least, human freedom, represented, say, by consent. Even Augustine, good old Gusty, as I sometimes refer to him, in his most austere later period, had to admit this much. However, once we allow any human action to worry is, then we can claim credit and merit. So, the Western tradition as a whole has been very clear on how to resolve the dilemma. Sacrifice freedom and hold on to the standard doctrine of grace. And if you're really sophisticated, you develop a thoroughgoing doctrine of compatibilism in order to sort of bring home the goose at Thanksgiving. <laughs> now, once again, deeper attention to the logic of causation I think can resolve this long-standing dilemma. Now, to come back to the intersection between theology and neuroscience, the debate to date, to date has centered on how to bring into harmony some elements of what I'm calling the metaphysical dimensions or focus of Christian claims about human nature with the robust claims of many neuroscientists. Notice I don't say neuroscience, scientists. The sticking point is obvious. Many theologians have been committed to a dualist vision of human beings, and neuroscience prima facie 
is committed, a committed foe of any and all forms of dualism as applied to human agents. Uh, by the way, the test case for this is what you're going to do in your eschatology. And what you think of what happens when you die, whether there's an intermediate state, and what form that takes. I think we're at a crucial turning point, not just in our culture, but also in the history of the Western Church. And I think we're at an absolutely crucial turning point in the history of the Methodist tradition. So I want to say this is a stark and inescapable choice for United Methodists as we move forward. We can have a church built on sex, on rebellion, on non-rational means of persuasion, on individual personalities, and on secular interpretations of experience. Or we can have a church that is built on our Lord's teaching on marriage, that is built on affectionate loyalty to the life and practices and doctrines of the church, that is built on rational and civil means of persuasion, and that is built on hard-won corporate conciliar consensus, and that in the end is built on Scripture and on the creeds. Now, if you hear nothing else, I want you to take that choice home and ponder it.